Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Changeways bring you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled, How Prenatal and Postnatal Exposure to PFAS Affect Child Cardiometabolic Health and Inflammatory Biomarkers in Six European Cohorts. Our moderator today is Janan Jensen, Executive Director of HEAL Envi Environment Alliance, this webinar is it's the fifth in our ongoing CHE EDC Strategies Partnership webinar series on PFAS science and policy. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will lead out questions for our speaker to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period, and we'll follow up as on, an, on an unanswered questions as we are able. For those of you who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. So with that, I'll turn things over to you, Shannon. Thank you very much, Hannah, and welcome to all the particip participants who joined us today. Uh, developing children we know are particularly vulnerable to the effects of exposure to PFAS chemicals and other chemicals. The authors of the study that we're going to hear about more today hypothesized that early life exposure to PFAS is associated with poor metabolic health in children. And so it's really my pleasure today to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. Eleni Papadupala, who is an epidemiologist and a researcher in the Global Health Cluster at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health in Oslo. She has a background in nutritional science and a PhD in environmental epidemiology, and she's focused on the potential effects of early life exposures to environmental contaminants, especially food contaminants, on fetal and childhood growth and metabolic health. She studied dietary exposures to emerging toxicants, including PFAS, and her work recently has contributed to the recent risk assessment per, for PFAS in food by EFSA in 2020. So it's really timely and we're really privileged today to hear about the research your team and collaboration is doing, given that the EU is actually working on a large restriction on PFAS as part of its ambitious chemical strategy for sustainability. So thank you, Elena, for being with us uh, on the EDC Chase Strategies Partnership webinar and a warm welcome. And I pass over the Zoom mic to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. That was so nice and the invitation and for giving you the opportunity to uh, present a, a small part of the work that is being done in the Helix project and the, and the athlete project as well. Um, Let's see, so today the story is about PFAS, the forever chemicals that are found in the environment, in our food, in our water, in our bodies. Um, this is the publication uh, that we're gonna be discussing and this is the focus of today's presentation. It's, a, as I said before, is a work within the Helix project. And if you are interested, you can also find uh, several publications within the same project in the same study population with, with their focus either in PFAS as a single group of contaminants or in the, uh, the, um, as a part of the exposome, of the whole exposome, with a lot of different uh, approaches and different uh, health outcomes. Um, yeah, so I will, I've decided I will just dive straight into the work and what we did, how we did it, and what we found. So our aim was to study the association between prenatal and postnatal PFAS mixture exposure and cardiometabolic health in young children, and also to understand what is the role of inflammatory, <clears throat> sorry, inflammatory status for this association we were studying. Um, the study population is the what we call the helix sub cohort. Uh, we studied 1,101 mother-child pairs from six ongoing um, birth cohorts in Europe. Um, we measured several PFAS in maternal blood that was collected in pregnancy and several PFAS in, chi in child's blood that was collected during the helix follow-up when the children were around eight years. I won't 
continue saying eight years, but there is a range between six to 12 years, but the mean age of the children in our study is eight years. And also we, uh, um, yeah, so the period of collection for the blood of the children is between 2013 and 2015. Well, for the mothers, this, uh, most of the samples were already collected and the period of collection spans from 1999 to 2010. We measured uh, six cardiometabolic factors in the children, three serum lipids, blood pressure, and waist circumference. And uh, within the helix, the sample collection, the sample analysis, and the protocols for all the outcomes have been harmonized across the six cohorts. So it's a lot of work behind what I'm presenting today. Um, this is our study population. So you can see the distribution of the population across the different countries and cohorts. Most 50% uh, of our mothers in our study are in the high education level. More than 50% uh, are had children from before. This is not their first child. The, the mean age is 30 years and most of them enter their pregnancy in the normal BMI category. When it comes to the children, we have half, half distribution of genders. Uh, and also, as I said, it's the children around the eight years of age. And these are some of their cardiometabolic factors that we have analyzed. I know this is not saying a lot to you. So to give a different perspective, we have a, po a population of, of children uh, of which 20% are in the category of overweight and obesity. 3% of our children have uh, relatively low HDL levels and 2% relatively high blood pressures and 29% of them have a high waist circumference. And these are based on comparisons with uh, uh, established uh, cutoffs in the literature for similar populations and similar uh, for the similar genders. Um, moving to the PFAS, we have measured the most abundant chemicals, the most abundant PFAS, and we found, let me see, yes, we found that uh, uh, these PFAS, we found them in almost all maternal samples, and the same for the children. The levels in the children are somewhat lower than their mothers, and this is expected. And these below are correlations in the below part of the table. So we have a correlation between the PFAS in the maternal samples, the correlations of the PFAS within the children's samples, and the correlation between maternal and child. It's the, it's the pairs that we are uh, correlating here. And you can see, of course, that the correlation within samples is higher than the correlation between samples, uh, but still, uh, even though the PFAS profile of the child eight years after birth can be quite different from the mothers, we still see some connections as for example, for PFOs, P PFOS and PFH excess. Um, our study population is what we call the low PFAS exposed population by comparison with uh, other published levels for mothers, uh, for, for women in pregnancy or not pregnant women that uh, their blood was collected and analyzed around the same time when the blood from our mothers was collected and analyzed and the same for the children. And it's a bit hard to see, it's a bit of a two busy figures, but we mostly compare with enhanced data and with studies in the literature that have assessed similar outcomes to ours. And we see that in our population, we are in the lower levels of exposure. Um, yes, so our statistical plan in brief, we wanted to analyze the exposure to the mixture of PIFA, so we needed the correct and the respective statistical methodology. Luckily, the analysis of mixtures has been gaining more popularity, and we have very good statistical tools now to answer our research questions. In this case, we applied the DKMR methodology. Not going into many details, but this methodology has been also applied before and after our publication for the study of PFAS mixtures for several health outcomes. Um, and it has several strengths and of course some limitations as a method. Uh, moving straight to the results, this is the, the main figure that appears in the paper, but also a summary of the results in, our ta in the table. Each row in the table is an outcome, a cardiometabolic factor. 
So we found a positive dose response association between the exposure to the prenatal and postnatal PFAS mixture with HDL cholesterol, a negative dose response association between the exposure to the PFAS mixture and the waste and waste circumference. And these were our strongest findings. We also found a negative association with triglycerides, though this was of a smaller magnitude, and a positive association with uh, systolic blood pressure but only for exposures above the higher than the 50th percentile of the mixture. And this approach, uh, this statistical approach also allows us to see what, the, what was the contribution of the, of the PFAS in our mixture for the specific outcome. So we could see, first of all, prenatal versus postnatal as a group. We saw that postnatal PFAS were driving the associations. And when we looked within each group, prenatal and postnatal PFAS, we, we would identify different congeners, different chemicals for different outcomes. And so we could see that different PFAS will contribute to the mixture of different outcomes. What's also, was also really nice with this methodology is that we can look inside the mixture and see what is happening with the individual PFAS for each of the outcomes. Now I have uh, uh, only given examples of the main uh, associations, the outcomes where we found our main associations, that was the HDL cholesterol, where we found a positive association with the mixture, and the waste it confers where we found a negative association. When we want to look inside the mixture, uh, we could see that the overall association was driven by, we already saw that it was driven by postnatal PFAS and more specifically by postnatal PFUNDA. PFUNDA is a long chain PFAS. And we have already uh, seen in the same study population that the, the main source of exposure to PFUNDA for these children is fish and seafood, which was also not surprising. But when we look at the prenatal PFA, PFA HXS, which was also a main contributor for the prenatal PFAS, you could see that the direction of association is completely the opposite. And this uh, happens again for waste circumference. The overall association is negative. This is driven by, by postnatal PFOA. We can see it in the contribution of the mixture as well. But when we look at the prenatal PFAS, prenatal PFNA has the opposite association. So These results do suggest that the detrimental effects on, of prenatal PFNA exposure to child adiposity that is measured by waste circumference. And the same for, for HDL cholesterol, that we have a, a detrimental effect, lower HDL cholesterol for children who were exposed to prenatal PFH excess. But in both cases, the effects of prenatal exposures are weaker than those of postnatal. And this is reflected in the overall effect of the mixture that is driven by postnatal. And then the, sec the second aim was to understand the role of the inflammatory status in the children. So we were very lucky to have measured, uh, it was more than 36 proteins, but we, uh, we included 36 proteins in, the, in, the, um, in our study that were analyzed in the child blood samples. And uh, we wanted uh, to, uh, to combine three panels of data, the cardiometabolic factors in children, the inflammatory proteins in children and pre and postnatal PFAS. So given that most of our data were assessed at the same time, all our data was assessed at the same time at eight years, but the prenatal PFAS, we selected a methodology that can show us the multidimensional connections between these three panels of data. And this would be, it was an integrated network, the XMWAS method. This is the beautiful picture that we, we obtained. We identified five major communities linkages with linkages between PFAS, cardiometabolic factors and inflammatory proteins. Many of our links here are confirmed in our previous analysis between the PFAS and the outcomes. There are very few connections between the PFAS and the inflammatory proteins, and most of them are negative, a negative correlation, as for example, the postnatal PFNA in the yellow cluster, uh, the postnatal PFOA in the orange cluster, but also we identified, I think, 
yes, we also identified this connection between prenatal PFOA, IL-1 beta, and WESI confirms all positively correlated with each other. Um, so if we make an attempt to, to summarize all the findings, overall, the, the exposure to, to a PFAS mixture with pre- and postnatal exposure was positively associated with uh, uh, HDL cholesterol and systolic blood pressure, and negatively associated with waste conference and triglycerides. The postnatal PFAS are driving the associations we found with the PFAS mixture, but also the prenatal PFAS within the mixture were associated with poorer cardiometabolic health, lower uh, HDL cholesterol and higher waste conference, but these associations were weaker. Most of the PFAS were negatively linked with inflammatory proteins. So we could identify a phenotype of children with, uh, who were low exposed, low, uh, exposed to PFAS in a low level, and they had this, what we call the beast induced inflammation, according to the inflammatory markers. And also this suggestion of an important role of IL-1 IL beta, for the, uh, for the link between prenatal PFOA exposure and at positive. We measure at positive by ways in conference. If we want to put our findings in the context of similar studies, our results confirm or add to the evidence that gestation is a period of increased susceptibility to the detrimental effect of PFAS, even though our associations were weaker compared to postnatal exposures. And this has been found from other studies looking at several windows of exposures like the home study in Cincinnati, where they had, uh, uh, they had higher PFAS exposure levels, they had longer follow-up and more repeated PFAS measurements. However, there are not many epidemiological studies assessing simultaneously PFAS exposure in several windows, in several periods like pregnancy and early childhood. Most of them are focused in pregnancy, but their results might be confounded by the unmeasured postnatal PFAS. And this might be contributing to the substantial uncertainty around this health outcome we have in the literature. And it's maybe reflected in the different opinions and, and reviews. Regarding the role of inflammation, there is still a lot of uncertainty around, uh, around this, whether this is the mechanism, the underlying mechanism between PFAS exposure and cardiometabolic health, but most probably we are in the right path. We are <laughs> in the right place to look for it because cardiometabolic health and inflammation are so well connected and their uh, link has been well described in the literature. So, uh, we found that the PFAS exposure in childhood were mostly negatively linked with these clusters of cardiometabolic factors and inflammatory proteins. And this is also seen in the literature confirming the role of PFAS on suppression of inflammatory response. We've seen studies showing suppressed antibody response to vaccination, increased occurrence of asthma, suggesting that the immunological response is lower when the uh, exposure to PFAS is, is higher. If you want to zoom out a bit more and, and, and look at these results and, and the contribution to, uh, to the overall demand for, for uh, regulations, we can, of course, say that we still need to protect the vulnerable populations against serious health impacts linked to PFAS exposures, like pregnant, pregnant women and young children, even at background level exposures, like, our, like in our study population. The global elimination of PFAS and PFOA, these are the main PFAS found in our bodies and in biological samples worldwide has been regulated through the Stockholm Convention, and this is covered in EU legislations, and we can really see and measure this, uh, the effect of this kind of uh, elimination strategies in, in blood samples uh, around the world. The restriction of manufacture of more PFAS has been approved and regulated and is to be applied in the EU, but of course there is room for more action. Um, the PFAS sub substances are currently being evaluated one at a time, like as PFOS or PFOA or others, versus uh, regulating entire families of chemicals, like all the PFAS, and this leaves leap loopholes in the current chemical regulations and leads to a lot of regrettable substitutions, which I really love this, uh, but it's, it's a reality. 
uh, regrettable sub substitutions in the market. Um, there have been a lot of barriers uh, reported on, on, the, on the way to find a common solution, as well as solutions. So uh, some of the barriers is the, the fact that PFAS are used in multiple products, uh, there are multiple sources of exposure for humans, there is variability of this substance, a large variability of the substance group. There is a lack of a complete overview on substances and uses. And of course, there's new patents and new chemicals in, from the same family coming in the market as substitutes. So uh, towards this, a common solution, towards uh, this common, common path, Athlete is working towards this. This is an EU funded project with several aims. Uh, and among those aims is also to break the silos and translate the acquired knowledge to pol for policymakers and citizens, make the data available to researchers, but also to policymakers and contribute together with other, the other nine um, uh, projects as part of the European Human Exposome Network. And, and also within the athlete and uh, I think for the whole network, the link of the environmental chemicals with cardiometabolic health of young adults will be one of the priorities and the priority outcomes of this project. Um, yes, and I think with this, I, I would like to thank all, all, my, all the people who contributed to this work and it's a lot more than what the people in this list. Thank you so much, Eleni. Thank you. Yeah, it is time now for our Q&A session, question and answers. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. We'll start off with our first question. I'm Janan. Would you like to read it out? Yes, and I just wanted to th thank you, Eleni. Uh, you know, a fascinating uh, study uh, and presentation, and I, I really appreciate that you've brought in how regulation um, can also is a strategy, an important strategy to reduce exposure for these uh, vulnerable groups. So that was very interesting. And I see we already are starting to get questions in and I have a question, I will go straight to it, um, saying it's a fabulous study. Um, and since this cohort is focused on low exposure, are you able to say how much your results compare to results to those who are unexposed and highly exposed population? Hmm. <laughs> interesting that's, that's question. That's interesting. It's, a, it's a, another context, of course. We, uh, usually we are able to compare, we know that European populations and especially young children are among low exposed or low background exposed populations. We, this is a study in um, <clears throat> around Europe that is not in, including hotspots or, or areas with uh, uh, increased uh, exposure to PFAS or leakages in the environment. So we usually are found in the position where we compare our results and our findings with uh, other studies with higher uh, levels of exposures so are highly exposed population, but again, in the in the in the context of background exposures, uh, and this happens usually because our main sources of exposures might differ. And then uh, it's very hard to answer this in the context of unexposed uh, populations because I'm not sure there is any such uh, case at least for the most abundant PFAS that we usually measure in high concentrations. Um, in terms of comparing with the studies with higher levels of exposure, we, we, when we have similar findings, like in this case, with the in comparison with the home study, where they did something similar and they have a bit older children. So this kind of, uh, confirms and strengthens the evidence that uh, you don't need to have very high exposed populations to get to, to see some uh, health effects. Of course, we are a bit far from establishing causations, but uh, I think we're all working for the same uh, goal <laughs> and the same aims. I'm, I'm sure I cannot really answer the question on the unexposed populations because it's, uh, 
uh, really hard to to tell if there are any. Thank you. Okay, I will move to the next question. And sorry, uh, Hannah, I just lost my screen. Um, would you help me by reading it out? Sure. So um, the next question uh, says, which PFAS were strongly associated with the decreased antibody response in vaccination, diphtheria, tetanus? Any idea how this response or this is possible biologically? I should have uh, <laughs> I should have gone through these uh, publications again on the pathways, but uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure I can give the complete overview of what uh, what has been seen in in experimental studies as well. But this is a quite consistent finding among experimental and epidemiological studies or human human studies, um, uh, and. Uh, I think the uh, PPR receptor is involved in the competition for, uh, I don't know if I'm using the correct words, I hope no toxicologists <laughs> are in the, in, uh, in the audience, but um, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can give the complete overview of the biological mechanism for this. Thank you. I will thank you. We will move on to another question. Uh, one is, were you able to control for possible confounding from other PFAS uh, in seafood, like PCBs, mercury, PDEs, etc.? For other POPs in seafood. Yeah, for other POPs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so our models uh, uh, were adjusted for, so we, we, we adjust for seafood. Uh, which is a bit of a different approach to what uh, what the the question is um, is exactly, but uh, uh, we uh, decided that this was a, a an approach to adjust for also the unmeasured chemicals in the in the same dietary source that we haven't measured in the in the children's samples. Mm -hmm. So the models are adjust for seafood intakes. Thanks, and I have um, kind of a wide open question. Do you have any reason to believe that any particular PFAS is substantially more or differently toxic than the others um, from this paper or others that you've worked on? Uh, the contribution of the different PFAS was really not, uh, there was contribution from different PFAS in the mixtures and this was not very easy for us to, to, to pick the, the bad actor, the one chemical that was uh, responsible. And also these factors we're studying, we're, they are describing cardiometabolic health, but the underlying pathways in, in the, bi the biology uh, that links the PFAS exposure to the actual health effect could be very, very different. And we made a small effort to study inflammation, but it could be uh, a quite different uh, a pathway that we haven't uh, thought about. So uh, uh, mentioning that also, I, um, I, I, yeah, I, there's, it's more of a comment on the an answer to the question that the, the long chain PFAS is that are uh, usually in a small, uh, in smaller concentrations than the PFOS and PFOA, the most studied ones, that uh, those, it's interesting that these ones keep popping up in our studies and we keep, um, we keep seeing that they might have an important contribution to the, to the health effects uh, that we measure, even though their concentrations are very low. Um, so this is kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, finding. Mm -hmm. In our study, for example, it was the PFUNDA uh, driving some associations, and this is a uh, uh, PFAS of low concentration. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I, I, I think we're almost out of time. And I just, uh, one very quick last question, because I think it's useful, like, you know, is there a place where people can find all of these publications and, and, new, and other ones that are coming out? Um, if there is, uh, yeah, if there's listed somewhere, uh, the, if you if you have a spot, 
Um, I think uh, the the website of the project of Helix mm -hmm. is usually very good at announcing our new publications there, and you could find the link to the to the um, to the journal, and the, you could find the link there. So I've I've left this list inside the presentation, so feel free good. to to find those and. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much for a very rich presentation and uh, for the work that you and your collaboration are doing. And we look forward to um, following and hearing more studies because this will be very important for the EU's restriction on PFAS, which has just been announced today, will happen, uh, will officially start in, in January 2023. So this will keep on our agenda, I think. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it back over to Hannah. Yes, thank you so much, Alani. Um, we're approaching the end of our webinar today. Uh, we would, a uh, video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing the link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership webinar will take place at 4 p.m. Eastern time today, and is titled Plastics and Climate Change, Consequences of Plastic Production Use and Disposal as a Major Contributor to Climate Warming and Harm to Health. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE web partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Lenny, for taking time to present today, and to you, Shannon, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Wishing all much health and wellness. Have a great day.